there are some some pretty clean yeast that don't leave a lot behind that will also give you mouthfeel. That's the cool thing is once you get familiar with these different yeasts and, and using the Bible, so to speak, uh, you can go in there and learn a lot of stuff and go, okay, well, this looks pretty good. Now I think I want to try it because, you know, this or that, because it, it makes sense to what I'm going to try to create. Now here's where I think requires a little bit of uh, testing. My friend and I, Jim and I, a year and a half ago, we made 25 single gallons of the same must. In other words, we, we mixed up a big big batch of must. We, we broke it up, and then we took it home, and we each made 12 or 10 or 12, maybe even 15 single-gallon batches, and each one of them was made and done the exact same way except for a different wow. yeast. <laughs> Because we wanted to learn what's the difference between D21 and D47. And, what's the best you know, way to do it? How else are you going to figure it right. out? Right. So we did find what I would say was out of those, we found you know five that were better than everything else. We found another five that were very similar with each other in that five, but they weren't quite as good as, as the top five. And then we found five that wasn't even worth ever trying to, to make again. In fact, on our tasting notes on that stuff, we just wrote no and, and left it at that. It's like, you know, I don't even want to try this again to get any tasting notes. Um, so, let's say you think you might want to make something with with this particular yeast. I would say don't go ahead and make your whole batch unless you're just planning on making a gallon. That's that's fine. Um, but some of us make, you know, larger batches. I, I wouldn't take the risk of making a 20 gallon batch on a yeast I've never tried before with a particular honey. But what I would do is I'd say, okay, I think I want to try and I'm going to make a small batch. Uh, that might be a, a gallon or three gallons. But anyway, let's, let's take this honey that I think I want to do this with. Let's try three different yeasts, treat them all the same and see which one is the best yeast for that particular variety of honey. Now, here's what I think really helps that is once you know which yeast works best for a honey in a traditional, that should work the best for any of the other things you want to make for the most part, I think. Because if it didn't taste good in the traditional, yes, you could add enough fruit that you're going to bury that, but why would, why, would you want to, why would you want to start making a big batch with it when it didn't taste good with the honey to begin with? And I, I realized, well, maybe because it says it's going to give me some good legs. Well, then let's pick another yeast uh, and use it and make some good legs in a traditional. Then we can blend them together after everything's said and done. So let's recap that. When you think you find some yeast that you like, do some test batches with it before you jump in wholeheartedly and make a giant batch with it. Mm -hmm. And I think for the m most part, when you find one that matches well with your honey, that's probably the same one you want to make a meth out of. It's probably the same one you might want to make a, a mellow mill out of or, or whatever, because you found the yeast that complements the honey. Um, yeah. So I don't know. That That's my idea of how to pick a yeast. Do you guys have any questions or comments? Well, um, the great Canadian yeast experiment that uh, Stephen <laughs> had um, in my in my living room, um, one branch of it, anyways, he sent uh, he sent a case out to uh, I think BC and another to Toronto and another around his place in Kingston. Um, but he used the same procedures and the same honey, and they really did taste different, and surprisingly so. Like I would not have expected to be able to tell that much of a difference just based on the yeast. So really, there is a lot of value in doing even just small bench scale yeast tests, even if you just you do it in like two liter pop bottles. Mm -hmm. You know, take one big batch, divide it up, and then treat it the same. And then if you want to find out something else, do the same, repeat of the same thing, only try it at a different temperature, and you may end up with completely different results depending on the yeast. Like we actually found... Um, it, with a straight, dry, traditional, we actually found a hint of malt from the D forty seven. You know, it was it was it was fascinating how 
how similar but how different they could be. Yeah. And I, I, I agree with that, but on the same token, I was kind of, um, I was shocked at how close a lot of them were. In other words, mm. we had five that were all very, very, very similar, and then we had another five that were very similar to each other. Um, and so if you went into the third five, that's a, that's a bit different than the first five, but um, I thought there would have been a much larger discrepancy between them all and... Um, Outside of ones that just totally sucked, the, the top ten were relatively pretty similar, I think, or more more so than what I thought they would be. Well, Stephen also. And you made a great. Really, um, Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say Stephen also used a really interesting way to calibrate our taste buds too. Um, every time uh-huh. he served us two meads, it was in three glasses. So the first thing you had to do to see if your taste buds were on par was pick out which one was different. Uh huh. And, you Which know, one was different from what you just had? Well, no. If you've got three cups in front of you, and you know two of them are the same thing, can you pick out which one? Oh yeah, the same? yeah. Oh, you know, and that, oh, that yeah. was a really that was a really useful trick to you know be able to sort of pick out and, and sort of once you figured out which one's different, then you you sort of um, then you can sort of taste two against each other, knowing that you've got two different things. And right. that that was actually a really valuable learning experience for me. Well, you know what? What Jim and I did, we we actually picked and overlapped. And I can't remember now. I don't. I don't remember very well. But I think it was either three or four that we did the same. In other words, we picked four yeast. That okay, on top of the the, the single test batches that are going to be all different. Let's let's make four that I'll make and you'll make the same, so How that we could see. Way. That's what I was. That was where I was going. Um, and one of the things that I so appreciated doing this with him is we both agreed on, in other words, neither one of us had to comp- compensate for the other guy's protocol beliefs at all. We were both exactly on the same page going, yep, this is exactly what we do. And so we both were on exact same page wanting to do what we were doing. And we did that to our best of our knowledge. And we went, we went through and we clicked off every little thing we could think about. But then when we did finally get to, together um, with some other people to taste them. Um, I'm not patting myself on the back, but we, we noticed that mine tasted a little different than his, and we, as a group, agreed that we liked mine a little bit better. And I was perplexed going, going, what? I don't, they, why did they taste any different? And we started talking a little bit, and what we think now was the difference we both fermented in, in open top containers with a cover over the top so stuff couldn't, you know, drop down from the sky. You couldn't have yeast parachuting into your your butt, your batch. Mm-hmm. But um, I like to ferment, ferment in an open top container until I get closer to the end of, of my fermentation. In other words, if you're in a big 20-gallon trash can, It'll be at 1020, and you, you're not getting any sense that there's anything, you know, coming off the top. But you take that then, which looks like it's dead or it's in a stationary phase, and you put it inside of a vessel with a with a airlock on top of it. It's bubbling like crazy. We found out through talking, and it was just by accident. I don't know. I'm I'm sure somebody was involved with helping this accident come to the forefront, or we would have never got it. Jim moved his in, Jim moved his into what I call locking it up, putting under a lock and key. He did that earlier than I did. Ah. And that was the only difference that we could tell, but here's what I think the difference was that we could taste. Jim's had what I call more of a heady, heady profile. There were higher alcohols. There was higher fusils. And not, when, some people, when you say fusils, they immediately assume attach that to a bad a fault but Mm -hmm. about half of the flavors that we taste are fusils so not all fusils are bad so anyway I believe that the way I made it and locked it up later versus him locking it up earlier he cut a lot of those gases that I was blowing off with with my uh, Leaster 
And so mine seemed more grounded. They weren't quite as aromatic. But I felt like the aromatics that I lost were the ones that I didn't really want to experience <laughs> tasting anyway. <laughs> and so it was interesting just to find that we did everything the same, except he locked his up earlier than I, and that made a difference. Okay, we've got a question from uh, Jaden. Sure. He, he's asking, what's the difference between fusels and esters? Fusels, does somebody else want to feel that or not? Um, a fusel is an alcohol, and I've forgotten what an ester is because it's been 20 years since I did organic chemistry. So a fusel is indeed an, an alcohol. Um, it's a higher alcohol, so to speak. Yes, it's created by the yeast, but it's because the yeast are unhappy, and so they're having to use different uh, pathways that they wouldn't choose to use if they were getting everything that they were wanting. So we've got a mad yeast in there. He's, he's having to cut his own two-by-fours to build some walls instead of having some walls, some two-by-fours already cut to size at all. He's got to do is grab them and stick them in place. And so he's mad that he's got to work more. And he's saying, you know what, I'm going to make you pay for that here. And he's, then he starts putting bad flavor into the mead. An ester is also made from the yeast, but an ester is a natural byproduct that the yeast make on their own accord just for being that particular lease is how he, how he smells without taking a shower, so to speak, instead of him <laughs> intentionally pissing in your mead. <laughs> Those are awesome analogies, i got to say. <laughs> no, no, but it's not pissing. It pisses out alcohol. It throws up esters and fusels. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Let's get it right here. If, you if know. I recall correctly back to my chemistry, esters are made by removing hydrogen from an acid or something, aren't they? That uh, part I don't know, but it. But I'd have to look it up. I honestly don't remember. Okay. I know I made the esters, lab, but, esters are uh, the aromatic, aromatic fruity compounds that are f uh, formed during fermentation, malolactic fermentation, and aging. So, um, and how they impact. Uh, we have links. I have a black belt in Google food here. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, okay, so. They're responsible for the general, esters are responsible for the generally fruity smells and, and flavors. Um, and yes. they're, they're found in grapes in small amounts, but usually, uh, at least in wines, they're formed during fermentation or aging. But they can be classified as either volatile esters for neutral esters or acid esters uh, or non-volatile esters. The neutral ones are produced through enzymatic reactions. Acid esters are formed in uh, simple hydrogen ion catalyzed esterification. Um, the I think that's what I said. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I, yeah, my, my chemistry is thirty years behind me, and I didn't do very well at it. So, and, and they didn't really talk about wine very much. If they had, I probably would have paid more attention. <laughs> but um, so you can get them either from. Um, it says there, you can form in two ways, from acetates, ethanol, and higher alcohols, or from ethanol and straight-chain fatty acids. Um, and ethanol, of course, is the alcohol that we're trying to drink. Correct. Yep. Um, ethyl acetate, isobutyl acetate, isyl amyl acetate, and two phenylethyl acetates uh, are included in ethanol and higher, ac uh, higher alcohols. So... Um, there's there's a lot there's a lot going on there, but I mean they can be good, they can be bad depending on what you're trying to get. Right. Yeah. They, they, I know one, has, one as one as there is the... All right, the one basic at a time. difference, as I understand <laughs> it, from from a, a tasting point of view, is that the fusels are um are alcohols that are not uh, normally ethanol, so they might be some of the nastier alcohols they may not be so nasty so methanol and um and butanol that you might get in there those other higher order uh, fusel alcohols um uh, are what we refer to as, as fusels and and the hot taste you get in the back of your throat is caused by normally by the fusels um whereas es esters are, are normally the the fruity smells and sometimes uh leads into flavor uh, beer, Belgian beers quite often throw a banana kind of ester, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So, 
And it also 